go ahead and just read Revelation chapter 8, and we're going to start, go ahead and read uh, 1 through 5. It says, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. So we're in Revelation 8, that's verse 1. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So that's the first part right before the trumpets start getting blown. And we actually mentioned some of this last week. We actually went into detail on, on much of it, but we're not going to do that again. But I do want to review at least the concept behind it. Uh, so we're into we're now we're into the wrath of God. We, we've been traveling through and when the seals opened up, remember, we talked about the fact that the first four seals are also known as the four horsemen. And that the first horse, which is the white, the rider on a white horse, he has a bow without arrows. And Daniel tells us that he speaks in riddles. So that's the Antichrist coming in what seems to be peace. But the reality of it is, is that's not ultimately his plan. And then immediately after that, the red horse is war. And then after that, famine is the black horse. And then the pale horse, which in the Greek is chloros, is green, is the horse of death. And so what we talked about was the fact that in those first four seals, these things can actually be accomplished by man. And in many ways, man is already accomplishing many of that. We, I believe personally that man has been fomenting or you ever seen how whenever you were in school, there was always an instigator, somebody that was instigating a fight. He might not necessarily get involved in it, but he was trying to get two people over here to get going. Well, the reality of it is, is that if you do any type of research on the side having to do with wars and a connection to an occult agenda, you're going to come up with information that shows that the occult has been actually instigating many of the wars, especially even since the French Revolution, specifically for purposes to put power in a smaller group of hands, ultimately hoping to bring the world back under a new world order. That's just information out there that you can read. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. But nevertheless, uh, it, it, there's an agenda involved in that. So what we called that last week was we said real quickly that that could be noted, noted as the wrath of Antichrist. Christ or the wrath of Satan in, a, in some type of way as he maneuvers and operates through the Antichrist. And then seal number five is that there's souls under the altar. So these are people that have been martyred. The, the scriptures are real clear. They've been martyred. So for whatever reason, they had to take a stand for, for Jesus and they had to give their life for him. But these are tribulation saints. So that's something different than, yes, there's people being martyred right now in Syria and other places like that. But that we, we would they're not tribulation saints because, listen, Seal number four, the tribulation hadn't hit yet. I can tell you that. There's people that would want us to believe that. But the reality is, is that when seal number four hits, the, the pale horse, a fourth of the earth, a fourth of the, the, the people on the earth die. When did we just calculate about 1.8 billion people? That ain't happened. Even that big old tsunami that took place that was just happen. maybe a hun hundreds of thousands or, or several tens of thousands, something of that nature there. There was a lot of death involved in that, but we're not talking about the, the, the wide scale death that we're talking about here. And I think it's important for us to realize that, right? That we don't get, that we don't get confused and caught up and, and, mm -hmm. and don't understand what's happening. But nevertheless, the seal number five, there's these souls that are under the altar, but then seal number six is a transition takes place. Something very different. Remember, we talked about that. The blood turns, the moon turns to blood. The sun becomes black. Stars start falling from the heavens. Man can't mimic that. Man can't. So that, and, and it's actually listed or spoken of in the book of Revelation as the wrath of the Lamb. So there's a big change that takes place. It goes from being the possibility of a wrath of, of mankind <laughs> upon the earth to the wrath of the Lamb, and man can't mimic that. And this is the true wrath of God that begins, in my opinion, to hit. In seal number six, okay? And so when we talked about some of that last week, but here we are now, we're about to go from when seal number seven is about to be opened up, it says that there's silence in heaven. And the reason that there's silence is that there's great awe about the judgment that's about to take place upon the earth. 
great judgment's about to take place upon the earth, and there's undoubtedly that's what's going on here with the silence that's taking place. But before the first trumpet is blown, there's a golden censer. And the golden censer ultimately is described that the smoke of the incense, along with the prayers of this, all the saints that have come up before God. And then there, the, the censer is given to an angel and this angel takes this censer, which is a beautiful piece of equipment, if you would allow me to say it that way, that was part of God's plan in ancient times. All, and we see it also in the book of Revelation. Now this thing is just cast to the earth. And to me, there's meaning behind that. And we got into it in a lot more detail last time, and I don't want to do that again. But we talked about these two stories that took place, one in Leviticus 10 about Abihu and Nadab, and the other one in Numbers 16, which had to do with Korah and his rebellion against Moses. In both of those cases, what we learn, or what we learn about the censer always is that it's part of the tabernacle, part of the temple, and it surrounds intercession. Literally, if you look up the word intercession, what you see in that word is that it describes contact. So the censer would allow the incense to be burned, and when the high priest would enter in beyond the veil... Amen. That 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 smoke from that incense provided an intercession, a go a, a go between between the high priest and the presence of God to protect him. And just as then the prayers of the saints are also sometimes equated with the incense, but incense is more about intercession than it is about just simple prayer. Uh, what is the difference between prayer and intercession? Well, intercession is when you're praying or interceding for someone else. You're, you're going as a go-between for someone else. Moses interceded for the children of Israel. That God was about to strike down and kill the children of Israel. He was also testing Moses at the time. But he told him, he said, I'm about to wipe them out. These rebellious children that you brought out of Egypt. That's what the Lord told Moses. These rebellious children that you brought out of Egypt. I'm about to destroy them. And then I'm going to create a new people. And I'm going to name them after Moses. Basically is what the Lord said. Moses said, oh, don't let such a thing happen. So the Lord's testing Moses' is hard also. But at the same time, Moses stands in the gap and he intercedes. So in a sense, this incense is, is providing intercession. And so you can also see all these prayers of the saints are also going up. And, and when what you got to understand is, is that in, in trumpet number seven, what is spoken of is the fact that God's kingdom is finally going to be brought upon the earth. And so all the saints of all the time should have been praying a prayer to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done and your kingdom come. And, and even as it is on, on in heaven, let it be so on earth. Amen. Amen. And, and so what ends up happening, though, is that. Nobody's listening. And in Leviticus 10, the problem was, was that Abihu and Nadab brought strange fire. What does that mean? They disregarded the cross. I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward thousands of years for you. They brought strange fire. They tried to light the incense from a fire that didn't come from the brazen altar, which is a type of the cross. So they disregarded God's plan and they disregarded God's person in the number 16 because Korah came against Moses. Moses was God's chosen one. And in the end, when the censer falls to the ground, finally, that's the reason wrath is hidden. Because for all these thousands of years, mankind has rejected God's way of salvation. They, they've rejected both the person, which was Christ, and the plan, which was the shedding of his blood. And now this censer is going to be slammed upon the earth. And it's about to open up and allow the first trumpet to be, uh, to be blown. Okay, And so that's where we, that's, and this is, this is a picture of the inside of the temple and I dropped this little red thing down to show you that's the, the golden altar we went into a little bit more detail but basically the golden altar this is interesting Paul lists it as though it was part of the furniture on the other side of the veil but it was on this side of the veil so it was literally considered to be a part of the holiest of holies but yet it was located in the holy place on the outside and so that's why they had to have a portable version of it, which was the censer that he brought in with him when he went in on the other side of the veil so that that incense could provide intercession. You know, in those two stories, the reason that I connected those two stories was that in both of those cases, they were judged. Korah and the, 
Korah was judged and Abihu and Nadab were judged. They were holding censers in their hand when they were judged. The thing that was supposed to provide intercession turned into judgment. You understand what I'm saying? And so this censer fall is thrown to the ground. And now the intercession time frame for unrepentant humanity is over. And now judgment is fallen upon the human race. All right. And so that opened up the, the trumpets and we said that there were seven trumpets. I thought this was interesting. I brought it up to you that seven trumpets were also blown when Jericho, when the walls of Jericho fell and that Jericho was a stronghold on the other side of the Jordan when the children of Israel were going to enter into the promised land. Remember that? And God caused Jericho to fall through his might. If you think about it, these trumpets are basically, you remember, <laughs> it just hit me whenever we invaded Iraq, what did, what did a long time ago, what did they call that shock and awe? Remember that? Yeah. Whenever they, they shot all those missiles over there, they said, yeah, we're going to do shock and awe. This is kind of like what's happening when we start blowing these trumpets. It's shock and awe upon earth. And ultimately what's about to happen is, is that God is taking and destroying the plan of the enemy and wrath is falling. And there's been a stronghold of sin upon the earth since the garden, just as there was a stronghold named Jericho on the other side of Jordan. And God caused those walls to fall down. When this wrath is hitting, when it's all said and done, the stronghold of sin is going to be removed. Amen. God is going to allow the anointed one, Jesus, to, to rule and reign upon the throne. Amen. Amen. All right. And so here's trumpet number one. Let's, let's go back to, let's read uh, Revelation 8, verse 7. It said, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, one of the interesting things to me is, is that in these first three trumpets, it just kind of hit me this time. I didn't necessarily see it last time. Blood is connected to it. So once again, because they refused the blood, I believe is what's being said, said here, because they refused the blood of the lamb, they're now being judged with blood, if you will. And it's mixed in with the judgment that's taking place. I also remember telling you last time that this reminded me just this picture when I saw it of the concept of Sodom and Gomorrah, unrepentant man refusing. And I kept seeing connections between. It really, all of the plagues can be connected back to Egypt. And I actually already taught on that a few weeks back. But, um, but I keep seeing these Old Testament types and shadows that are being fulfilled in the book of Revelation. Fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people uh, refusing to, uh, you know, to repent and, and to live for God. And instead living in the midst of wickedness and the same thing basically is happening now. And so it burns up, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, what did it say? A third uh, of um, a third of the of the trees and the, and the grass was burned up. So here's a uh, trumpet number two, Revelation chapter eight verses eight and nine. And the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. You see, there's blood again. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, what we talked about was, is that a mountain, we, I mentioned the fact that it could be a meteor, it could be considered a meteor or something of that nature that was burning because in order for those ships to be destroyed like that, surely some type of a tsunami or something like that took place. Uh, but what ends up happening, according to verse, um, it, it says that because of it, that the third part of the sea became blood. Now, last time I mentioned this. Judgment, the fire, I underlined it this time, fire on top of the mountain whenever Moses went to get the Ten Commandments. God was given his law. I'm just showing you this is another example of judgment. God's giving the law. Mankind has refused to keep the law. Here was a, a burning mountain that showed God's glory. And in the book of Revelation, mankind has, has refused to live according to God's word. And so therefore, a burning mountain is thrown into the ocean. I mean, this is just something that popped in my head. I mean, and, and, and so that's why I put it there. All right. But this is and so it had a picture of a burning mountain. I didn't have this picture the last time. Remember that whenever this burning mountain fell into the water, it says that a third of the water turned to blood. And I was trying to make you connections also where I believe that mankind will try to mimic these things. And what I mean by that is, is that if the enemy of our soul really, by the way, I'm going to be 
probably in about three or four weeks, I'm going to start the series uh, uh, Cult Exposure that I taught at Franklin. And the main reason that I'm doing that is because there's a lot of people that have been in the church that aren't aware of all that information. And I refer to it a lot. And I refer to different concepts from that. And I just want to make sure that we've done the best job we can. To, we're not even going to video it. We're just going to teach it for the people that come to church. And then when we're done with it, we're going to be done with it. But at least hopefully as I refer to things and it's full of scripture and it's full of the Bible and it connects the Bible to all of that stuff. But so what I was trying to show you last week and I'm going to and we're going to look at those script, those pictures again is that if there is truly an organized plan of the enemy to bring deception and to try to cause this, like we're call it, talk, calling it a new world order, then you would think that there would be ways that they would attempt to mimic things that are taking place in the Bible. Now, I thought it was interesting, so I put this, this picture last time, but then I decided to go ahead and get one of these pictures. Because, because the next picture was the, was the BP oil spill that I showed you. And so, but what you see here is something that kind of looks like a burning mountain. Now it didn't fall into the ocean. But my point is, is that you see the level of deception. You can have a, a rig on fire that's in the middle of the water. And then the oil spill that takes place, it looks like, it looks like blood. Now I don't, I can't explain to you why they would try because, because once again, we know that, that we're not in the tribulation because all of those people haven't died. At the same time, why, if, if it is possible that some things like this would be taking place and man was actually trying to mimic things, why would they do it? Can I, can I just pose to you the possibility of black magic on a grand scale and, and, and attempting to try to move the, you know, I'm going to say this and I'll say it on the camera. I'm not scared because whenever we teach a cold exposure, I'm going to, I'm going to say it to you again. I, I personally am starting to believe from the thing and, and whenever I teach it, you'll be able to understand why I'm saying it. That World War II, to me, almost looks like a rehearsal for the big dance. <laughs> you do what you want with that, but I'm going to make some connections for you when we get into that. And I'm going to show you world leaders and who they were working with in the midst of all of that. And I'm going to show you the occult connection regarding the Nazis and, and all of the things that were taking place. And to me, whenever you start to see it for what it really is, it almost looks like it was a dry run or a rehearsal for something bigger down the way. Now, you just keep that in the back of your mind. You think the preacher's crazy if you want. I'm the one that said it, not you. You're off the hook. But at least that little seed's been planted in your mind, all right? And, uh, and, and you do what you want with it when it's all said and done. But anyway, that's, that's what I think. Anyway, all right. Revelation 8, 10 and 11. It says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. You remember what I told you all last week about Wormwood? We'll, talk, we'll say it again. But I thought that was interesting. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So once again, um, it talked about the rivers and made, being made bitter. And uh, I wanted to point out too to you that that so in the third trumpet <clears throat> it talks about um, these these rivers. The one at the top was the Yangtze River in China, and it turned blood red, and nobody really knew what was causing it. And I'm not sure what that bottom picture is, um, but I do know that. In the marshlands, whenever the whenever that oil hit in the marshlands from the BP oil spill, it looked very much like congealed blood. But that so the word wormwood was interesting because we I, I found out as I was studying some various sources and I double checked it that the word the name Chernobyl in Russia literally means wormwood. And if you'll remember that story of the Chernobyl incident where that nuclear reactor exploded and it spewed radiation into the into the atmosphere and uh, actually I mean people ended up getting cancer and I mean this is just a that's a picture of it spewing it, it's just kind of it, it, that you know I guess it could be coincidental I guess it could be accidental but I am so convinced that there's an organized effort to cause things and once again I don't I mean, I hope that you can start to see it with me, but if you don't, it's okay. I'm still going to say it because I believe it. And I want people to be prepared to at least be able to see the possibility that that could be the case. 
I just find it very strange that the Bible says that there that, that something like that happened and they called it Wormwood. And this particular place named Chernobyl, which was Wormwood, had a nuclear reactor that exploded and caused all this problem. But anyway, I mean, maybe it was just coincidence. And so that's what resulted in that. I put this picture later, too, because uh, I don't think I had this the last time because it said a star fell from heaven. Did I have this one last yeah. time? Yeah. Did I? Okay. And so like a missile coming in and having possibly nuclear material would be a man's way of trying to do, fix that. I know I told you all about this last time. The Illuminati card game, the oil spill. I didn't think that that was too convincing because of the Alaskan Valdez oil spill. And be, but, but the thing is, is that I told you all that this card game was developed in 1995 and 9-11 didn't happen until 2001. And these cards were already in the deck when that happened and it has the Pentagon on fire and it has the, so this is just evidence of the possibility that there is some type of an organized effort. I mean, you do, I've researched this multiple times before I ever said anything about it and I put it in the book and all I'm saying is, is that it sure is strange. At least it's enough to get my attention and to make me think about some things. Would you not say so? I mean, it's yes. copyrighted, uh, that it was made in 1995. All right. Now we're moving forward. Uh, Revelation 8, 12. The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld, verse 13, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And so God created on that on that particular day when he created, uh, I don't remember if it's exactly the third day, I didn't write it, write it down in my notes, but he created the lights in the, in the sky, amen, to, to separate the night from the day. And he created the stars all on that day. And at the same time, he, in the end, when he judges it, he's going to cause a third of that light to, to quit shining. And this is a physical darkness that's going to come upon the face of the earth. But whenever the next trumpet sounds, we move from physical darkness into spiritual darkness. And so that's what uh, that's what we're going to see in this next passage of Scripture. Revelation chapter nine, verses one through eleven. So we're just going to read this long passage of Scripture and then we'll talk about it. For a while. This will finish us up for tonight. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, right off the bat, there's a difference between this star and the last star. Okay. The last star that we talked about, which took place in trumpet uh, number. Trumpet number. Let's see. The third angel sounded. There fell a star from heaven. Verse 10 of chapter 8. So the third trumpet caused a star to fall from heaven. It was burning as a lamp. It fell into a third part of the rivers. Now the word of God teaches that many times stars represent are representing angels. So in the first in the first uh, trumpet that sounded right here, this third when this third angel sounded to me, this sounds like it would be a meteor or some type of an asteroid or or the you know something of that nature. Or I'm not saying that it can't be the possibility that John visualized something that he didn't know how to describe and that it could be a missile. I'm not saying that that it couldn't be a missile in the future looking like a star falling from the sky and causing wormwood to take place in a river. Many people have come, tried to have desired to come up with uh, physical interpretations of all of the things that are taking place in the book of Revelation. I don't think that you can that you can say that it's that it's all man made that that this could either be a star or a missile. But I will say in a second we're about to get to one spot where people have tried to interpret it as though it were helicopters. And I'm going to tell you right now it can't be helicopters because the Word of God tells us really what what it is. But this star, what I want you to see, is different than the star that fell when Angel Number Three sounded his trumpet. It, this star is given a key. And most commentators will tell you before I even read a commentary, I knew in my spirit that this was talking about Satan. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heavens to the earth. And the word of God is saying right here that a star fell from heaven and that unto him was given a key. And this key opened up a bottomless pit. 
And in this, what, what ended up happening was, was that in verse 2, he opened the bottomless pit. There arose smoke out of the pit, and as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Now people have said as this goes on that it's actually describing some type of a military helicopter. But as we go on, I'll show you why that can't be the case. The shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had their hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. So that was probably why that first interpretation of helicopters came up because it would sound probably like a, maybe a, I don't know what you call it. I'm, and surely it's not called a fleet, but several helicopters coming in would probably sound like the, 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 the sound of these chariots is what they're describing. Uh, and they had tails, on, tails like unto scorpions. Have you noticed how many times it describes scorpions in there? I just want you to hold that in the back of your head. Tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. But this is where you know that it's not a helicopter. Verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. And that name in both Greek and Hebrew is the destroyer. Now, some people have interpreted that this angel that's in the bottomless pit over these, these are demons. And what we're be, what's being described to us is how they look in the spiritual realm. That's my understanding of what's going on here. These are not helicopters. This is a star falls from heaven, which is Satan. He's given a key. At some point in the, in the in determined in the future, God is going to allow the release of. You, do you remember this? You remember I taught this many times, but and I've even taught it since we started the Book of Revelation. In the book of Jude and also in 2 Peter, we have evidence in the New Testament that describes what happened in Genesis chapter 6. Y'all remember what happened in Genesis 6? That the sons of God, which is talking about fallen angels, the sons of God, you won't hear this down the road because they won't preach it to you. The sons of God, which represent fallen angels, and we know that because it says it in both the book of Genesis and also in Job. The word of God says in the book of Job that there was a day when Satan presented himself before God and the sons of God came along with him. Yeah. And those sons of God is Ben Elohim and is talking about fallen angels. And it says in Genesis chapter six that whenever that whenever mankind began to multiply on the earth and there were daughters born unto men, that the sons of God saw that they were beautiful and came in unto them. Now, how this all goes down, I'm not going to, I don't have the time to go through it with you. I've explained myself at nauseum in the past, and we're not going to do that now. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Somehow, there was a cohabitation that took place, and a hybrid race called Nephilim or giants were in the land. There was so much occult activity taking place at those times, and the, man, the heart of mankind and the mind of man, the sorcery was unbelievable and so rampant upon the face of the earth that God destroyed destroyed the earth with a flood. Now there were still these Nephilim Crete, you know, Goliath would have been a Nephilim and there were multiple ones that Joshua dealt with and we don't have time to get into how they would have made it through the flood but there's various ways that the, 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 the angels could have come back again but nevertheless what I want you to know is, is that the ones that transgressed those boundaries the word of God teaches and it's, and it's built into the Greek language that in the book of Jude, they left their original state. And really what it's talking about is they left their angelic bodies and they 
came in unto these women. Now, the, this, this goes along with all the mythology of Greek of the Greek culture and all that stuff. But the reality of it is, is that they stole the stories from the Bible, the real story. All of mankind knew that this was going on. I, I, I tried to give you a little bit of background to try to explain to you where this fallen angel comes from. And that was in the bottomless pit. And so the word of God says in the book in second Peter and also in the book of Jude that these angels are reserved in chains of darkness until the great day of judgment. So these angels transgressed in a way that other fallen angels maybe didn't. And God locked them up in chains until that day of judgment is going to come. And whenever it comes, there's a star that has already fallen from heaven. And unto that star that fell from heaven is given a key. Now, now uh, let, me, let, me, let me slow down a little bit. Revelation 12 talks about a, a, a battle that takes place. We didn't really, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but there's a battle that takes place in Revelation 12. There's a sign in the heavens, a woman clothed in the sun. She's got 12 stars. It represents the 12 tribes of Israel. The woman is Israel. She's pregnant with a male child. People argue over who the male child is. I'd say it's Jesus. All right. She's pregnant. It's telling the whole story. She's pregnant with a male child to give birth unto him. And then there's a red dragon. And the red dragon wants to devour the male child. Who's the red dragon? Satan. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that then it goes on to say that there's a war in heaven. See, everything that happens on earth, there's also a corresponding something that's happening in heaven. And at the same time, there's a war that takes place in heaven. And it says that Satan and his angels war against Michael and his angels. And at that point in time, Michael and his angels prevail over Satan. He's cast to the earth. He's already been cast spiritually in the sense that he can't just go up and he doesn't have his dwelling place in the throne room of God. But he has to still present himself like in the book of Job when God tells him to. But there's coming a day when he will no longer be allowed. His presence no longer there for any purposes whatsoever. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And on that day when he's cast down, the word of God says that now the kingdom has be the kingdom of the earth has become the kingdom of our Lord and that the accuser accuser of our brethren, hallelujah, has been cast down. The one that accused you and I day and night no longer, now his mouth is shut, but it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for he comes down to you with great fury, for he knows that his time is short. Yeah. So whoever's on the earth at that point in time, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, because he's coming down with great fury. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be here at that point, and I don't think that we will. Amen? There's no reason for that. But hallelujah, if I misinterpreted it, and I am, all I know is I need some grace, Lord. We, look, the Apostle Paul, you gave it to him, you gave it to Peter. Lord, help this preacher right here. Amen? And if he can get them through it, he can get us through it. Amen? Amen. Praise God. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and he's given a key. And he opens up this abyss, he opens up this pit, and all of a sudden these locusts, demonic spirits are coming out. Mm -hmm. And then we find out that there's an angel in there. Now some people have interpreted and said that Abaddon or Apollyon is Satan. No, mm -hmm. Satan's not in a pit. Mm -hmm. Satan's roaming to, a, 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 to and fro, looking for him whom he may devour. Okay. Where you been, Satan, is what God asked uh, Satan in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. Up and down, to and fro. Right. Yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not locked up right now. That's right. That's right. Abaddon is one of them, that is. That's right. Apollyon, this dude's, he ain't nothing nice. But he's been locked up and being reserved for the day of judgment. A key was given to the Satan. He opened up this bottomless pit, and now these de demonic forces have been released, and there's an angel that's over them. All right, Revelation. And we, we talked about these locusts and how they sounded as though they had uh, scorpions. So we're into spiritual darkness, the fifth trumpet, a key opens up the bottomless pit. <laughs> this is a picture that I found that kind of described all the things that were in it. It's kind of crazy looking. But uh, it's got like a face of a man, a cr golden crown of some sort, hair like a woman. And it's got a stinger of a scorpion. And this sting hurts men when it say five months and they'll be wishing that they could die, but they don't. It's demonic is what I'm trying to tell you. It's a it's demonic, and we're getting we're getting a glimpse into the spiritual realm. God's letting us see what they look like in the spiritual realm. I think it's interesting 
that, that we're told that. And I'm about, to, I'm about to tell you why here in a second. I'm about to show you a scripture that I think connects all of this. But in this particular demonic entity, I want you to see the connection, once again, of the scorpion. All right, so Revelation chapter 6, I'm sorry, Revelation 9, verses 13 through 21. We're going to read that real quick. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So the point here is, is that these are four more angels that are bound. This same word bound in the Greek is used for Satan. When he's bound in the bottomless pit, he will be bound in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. During the millennial reign of Christ, the enemy will be bound. It's the same Greek word that binds Satan that's talking about these four angels that are bound in or on or whatever the case having to do with the river Euphrates. Some people would say that there's a physical, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe the part of the abyss is under the Euphrates River. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, didn't they say something kind of like that in that video? Mm -hmm. uh, Perry Stone had a video and, and maybe that's the possibility. I don't really know, but I do know that that angels are bound like we just talked about and that one day they're going to be released. And the four angels, verse 15, were loosed. Now, I said that they were, before we go on, it said that they were going to kill a third. Yeah, in verse 15, they were going to kill a third part of men. So there's already been a fourth part of men killed whenever the fourth seal was opened. Now there's a third part of men killed. This is like, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but that's like pretty much close to half of the world right there, right? Mm -hmm. And so... It goes on to say in verse 16, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. And now, some translation I think would tell you 200 million. I think that that's how you do that math. Uh, so 200 million army man, a man army. Now, many people have interpreted this literally too, and maybe there is a 200 million man army. I don't doubt it. Matter of fact, I tried to to download the, the article, but I couldn't get it because I would have had to subscribe and I didn't feel like doing it. But I found multiple sources that backed it up, so I believed it. 1965, May, May, May 1965, page 35, Time Magazine, China boasted that they had a 200 million man army. And so as we're about to see here, the, the river Euphrates, is. it's interesting that that border is used, and I'm going to explain that to you in a second. But so I'm not questioning whether or not there could be a 200 million man army. I believe that there could be, especially if North Korea and China got together, uh, that, which that's not unheard of because they're already kind of like more buddy buddy than what we realize. And, and, and so but what but I, what I do want you to see before we even move on is, is that these 200 million, whatever these things are, were also being shown that there's a demonic force behind that see so what's going to be described to us are demons again and there may be actual demons that correlate to how many of a man army it is does that make sense what i'm yeah. saying right. but we're given a picture into the spiritual realm too of these demonic entities that are going to be the power behind these uh these th this army that's that's going on here so verse 14 says saying to the Sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound at the great river Euphrates. Let's go on down to verse 16. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I heard the number of them in verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. And then that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these... Three was the third part of men killed by the fire. What three? Well, I believe it has to do with the first demonic entities that we're talking about. The, the four angels that were loosed at the river Euphrates along, uh, and along with Abaddon. And then also with these other demonic entities and the possibility of an army of that size also. All right. So for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents. So the first ones we heard about were likened unto scorpions and the second entities are likened unto serpents. Okay. And it says in verse 20, and the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. 
that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So what we see here is that all this judgment is being poured down upon unrepentant humanity. God has been merciful through the thousands of years of human history, explaining his plan of salvation. But there comes a day when grace runs out and wrath is poured upon mankind. So let's just kind of go through. We're going to stop at trumpet number six. And we've got about eight minutes left. And i got some different slides that I just kind of wanted to talk to you about a little bit. So we're talking about the river Euphrates, and what, one of the things that you'll notice out of this passage of Scripture is that originally God had told Israel that every place that their foot tread all the way to the border, which was going to be the river Euphrates all the way to the east, and then their western border was going to be the Mediterranean Sea. They never did capture all of that because they never believed God in it all, and they ended up being disobedient. But so the river Euphrates is right here. Now... I know I stepped out of the camera, and I'm sorry about all that, but the river Euphrates is here, and so Israel is from this part, it was supposed to be from, from here back. So all this is east, Israel's over here. So if you can imagine, to speak to you in America, you live in Louisiana, if you wanted to go to Florida, it would be over there, right? Israel's over here, Babylon or the east is over that way. This area between the two rivers, this is the Tigris River and this is the Euphrates River, is known as Mesopotamia, also known as the land between the rivers. This is where Iraq is now. Iraq is in this area here. The, theoretically, this is, where, this is where the Tower of Babel would have been. This is where Nimrod's kingdom was. Nineveh, all this area here was where Nimrod started the whole new world order with the Tower of Babel, where the languages were confused. So this is... This is really, if you will, a tale of two cities. And what you have is, is in one city, starting with the Tower of Babel, mankind with his own hands, come, let us make bricks. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a city and a, and a, and a tower that extends into the heavens. So in one tale of the city, mankind is attempting in Genesis 11 to build his own kingdom and his own dominion and his own empire. And really what he's doing when he extends into the heavens is he's con contacting demon spirits. We don't have time to get into all that right now. But he's a, but but the enemy of our soul is using mankind in order to try to bring his plan into fruition. And so you have on this side of the uh, of, of the river over here the, the evil eastern empire if you will and on this side the city known as Jerusalem God's city chosen by God uh, inhabited by a man named David a King David who was a forerunner of the Christ amen who for who the Christ comes from his lineage if you will and one day Jesus who is the fulfillment of the Davidic king will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years and so amen. what we see with the with the border of, of the Euphrates is that it borders the evil area. On the other side of Euphrates is represented evil and it says unloose these angels from the Euphrates and so that whole area up in there after the fall of mankind is representative of an evil area if you will. I know that George Bush called it the axis of evil I think he'd said but to some extent. So there's just another picture and you can see Israel is over here. This little small area up in here, this little strip, and here's the Euphrates River. And so all of that was supposed to really be Israel's, but they never took it like I told you earlier. All right. So that was the picture of the, of the four angels that were bound at Euphrates. And, we, and, and so here's some pictures of these demonic entities. You know, the horses had heads of lions. And, but one of the things I wanted to point out had to do really with the tail. And I mean, this is just one artist's depiction of it. But I wanted you to be reminded of the serpent on these. And then on the other ones, it had to do with the scorpion. So I got pictures of both of them right now. One of them had to do with the scorpion. The other one had to do with the serpent. The reason I wanted to put these two by two, and I wanted to make the point to you that I'm convinced that these are speaking of demonic entities. And this is why I'm going to tell you right here, this passage of scripture. Uh, well, I wanted to point this out first, the connection between the scorpions and the serpents, but I've already done that because I told you that multiple times. Look what Jesus said. He sent out 70 and they went out and remember that when they came back and oh, they were excited. Let's, actually, let's turn there. Luke chapter 10. Verse 
Verse, let's start at verse 17 if you have your Bibles open. And I'm going to read to you. And the 70 returned again. Remember he sent them out at 70, two by two? The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. So what did they find out on their little trip? That when they took authority in the name of Jesus, the demon spirits, because that's what the word devil is translated from demonier and is descriptive of, of demon spirits. All right. Even the devils are subject unto us through your name. Verse 18. And he said unto them, let me tell you why. Because I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's not in victory. He's already defeated. Amen. Amen. God cast him out of heaven. And I saw it. See, now when Jesus says this, he's the pre-incarnate word that spoke the world into existence. You understand that? Is that, is that too big to wrap your brain around? Before Jesus ever became flesh, he was the, he was the eternal word that spoke the world into existence. He was, he's the all-existent one. He wasn't created. He's the creator. The Amen. Father used him to create. He is the word that spoke. And when Jesus was the word, he said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning to the ground. And now I'm in the flesh and I'm here to tell you about it. And he said, this is why you have a authority over them because I beheld him to fall as lightning to from heaven and verse 19 behold I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you that's a word of encouragement for somebody right listen like I said hopefully we ain't here brothers and sisters but the good news is that today in the spiritual realm, you might not be able to see what they look like, but they got demon spirits that look like scorpions and some that look like serpents. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to fear them because in the name of Jesus, we have power and we have authority over them. Hallelujah. Because Jesus defeated them at the cross and you and I can hold on to that truth and walk in that power and that anointing and they will obey just as they obeyed him. They will obey the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. He goes on to Amen. say, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Oh, Jesus. Thank that doesn't get all to your heart right there. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm get feeling the Holy Spirit on that because I am not wanting to spend my eternity with these things. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Help us to make sure our hearts are right. Amen.